Welcome to Hay on Haven. I'm Dawn. Today we're discussing Chapter 5 of the Tale of Genji, Waka Murasaki, Young Murasaki, or Little Purple Gromwell. As is suggested by the title, this is a chapter in which we meet the character Murasaki. This is the same character that may be the source of our author's moniker. We'll start with our usual summary. Chapter 5 picks up a few months after Chapter 4. It's now spring, and Genji has been suffering from recurring fevers. All the usual charms and spells have failed, but he's heard of a healer up in the mountains and sends for him. The hermit declines, citing his old age, so Genji sets off to visit him with only a handful of attendants. In between the hermit's ministrations, Genji and his attendants see pretty little girls at the bishop's residence just down the mountain. Genji's attendants distract him from his illness with descriptions of mountains and faraway seashores, finally talking of the bay at Akashi in Harima province. Yoshikyo, son of the current governor of Harima, and one of Genji's retainers, tells his lord of a priest, the former governor of Harima, who lives on the bay with his wife and beautiful daughter. This priest has such high hopes for his daughter that he tells her to throw herself into the sea if his dreams for her are not realized. His fever had not returned, but the old healer recommends Genji stay the night on the mountain to be prayed for. Deciding to set off at dawn, Genji dismisses his attendants who return home keeping only Korimitsu with him. Bored, he ventures down to the bishop's fence, peeps through and sees a nun, her attendants, and a few young girls. Into this mix comes an extraordinary young girl, crying over a lost sparrow. As Genji watches the young girl, he realizes that she looks just like his beloved Fujitsubo, his father's youngest consort, and begins to devise a plan to make the child his companion and train her as an ideal wife. The bishop warns the women that they can possibly be seen where they are, and the blinds are closed. Back at the hermit's cave, Genji receives an invitation to the bishop's home and goes to spend the night there. Speaking with the bishop, Genji discovers that the young girl is the niece of Fujitsubo. He asks the bishop, and later the bishop's sister, the nun, if he can have the child. The nun dismisses his entreaty entirely because the child is only 10 and is therefore much too young to be a wife. In the morning, the old healer manages to go to the bishop's house to perform a protective spell for our protagonist. Genji's entourage returns, and they all snack on fruits and nuts. Genji promises to return to the mountain, and the three men exchange gifts. Genji sends a message to the nun, who tells him in four or five years she will welcome his proposal. Before he can leave, a number of people show up, including his brother-in-law, Tono Jujo, and they all have a musical entertainment sitting under the late season blossoms before returning to the capital. After telling his father about the healer, Genji is persuaded to go to Sanjo by his father-in-law. Genji asks his wife, Aoi, to act more kindly to him, and she rebuffs him coolly. He continues to think of the girl and sends letters to the bishop, the nun, and the young girl. The response is again, the child is too young. He sends yet another letter with Korimitsu, who has instructions to talk to the girl's nurse, Shonagan. His proposal is again rejected, but he learns that the nun and her granddaughter would be returning to the capital soon. Princess Fujitsubo becomes ill and withdraws from the palace. Seeing an opportunity, Genji convinces her maid, Omiobu, to arrange a lover's meeting. Fujitsubo immediately regrets what they have done and now lives in fear of the consequences if their affair is discovered. Genji avoids the palace for a few days and due to a guilty conscience, is alarmed by the concern shown by his father, the emperor. Fujitsubo becomes more ill and soon discovers she is pregnant. She refuses all of Genji's letters and her maid, Omiobu, refuses to any longer act as a go-between. Consumed by regret, Fujitsubo avoids the palace for a time, even after her condition is made public. Genji realizes the child is likely his. In the summer, Fujitsubo finally returns to the palace. The emperor receives her warmly. She and Genji both get caught up in their feelings anytime they are near one another during official events and musical entertainments. Meanwhile, the nun's health has improved and she returned to the capital. Genji continues to press his case for the young girl and the nun continues to refuse. Sometime later, while on his way to one of his secret affairs, Genji stops at the nun's house, finding that she has once again become ill. The nun again tells him that when the girl is older, she will consider his proposal. More time passes and Genji receives word from Shonagan that the nun is returning to the mountain and is not expected to make it much longer. 
Autumn arrives, and Genji is thinking of Fujitsubo and is overcome with a desire to possess her little niece. Genji sends a letter to the nun at the mountain retreat and receives a response that the nun has died the previous month. After the 20-day defilement period ends, the girl returns to the capital and Genji goes to visit. After speaking with the girl, he slips behind her curtains and speaks of whisking her away to a bright palace full of paintings and toys. He stays the night to protect her from a hailstorm, leaving before dawn like a lover would. On his way home, he decides to stop by the house of an occasional lover, but is rebuffed. Included with this morning after letter to the young girl are several paintings. The girl's father, Prince Yobu, comes to visit and informs his daughter that she will be moving to his home. She is left grieving for her grandmother and her nurse and attendants can't comfort her. Instead of showing up the next night, Genji makes excuses and breaks the custom of spending three consecutive nights making a relationship official, sending messages via Koremitsu. Shonagun tells Koremitsu that Prince Yobu is coming for his daughter the next day. When Koremitsu informs Genji, who is currently with his wife, Aoi, at Sanjo, Genji orders his carriage to remain ready and close to dawn, sets out to the young girl's home. He forces his way into the house and gathers a sleeping and then very frightened child in his arms. Shonagun goes with them as Genji takes the child to his mansion at Nijo. Genji installs the child, who we'll call Murasaki, in the west wing of his mansion, plies her with gifts, playmates, and toys, and begins her training to be his ideal woman. Before we get into translation differences and our usual analysis, I need to pause and acknowledge what happens in this chapter. It's neither pretty nor romantic. Genji kidnaps a child and begins training her, what we now call grooming. Even within the chapter, Genji knows what he is doing isn't right. He fears being called a lecher and a child thief. His foster brother, Koremitsu, is just as astonished as Shonagun when Genji just walks into the house and scoops up the sleeping Murasaki. What he has done is neither normal nor acceptable then or now. He is 18 and she is only 10. He gets away with it due to his rank. He's an emperor's son, and though he was made a commoner, a Minamoto or Genji, he is still treated as though he was made a prince. It's privilege and an abuse of power, and I find it reprehensible. I'm certain those of you watching who are also reading along feel much the same way I do. Our shining Prince Genji is not a good person. There will be plenty more instances and examples of just how wicked a man Genji really is. Some of it will not only be hard to read, but could likely be triggering. That unpleasantness out of the way, Let's talk a little about translation differences. And like the last chapter, I want to start with the difference in the title translation. Waka Murasaki seems to be used by four of our five as the base to translate from, Weili only using Murasaki, without a translation into English. In our title translations, Suematsu uses Young Violet, Seidenstecker, Lavender, Washburn translates it as Little Purple Gromwell, and similar to Weili, Tyler does a half translation using young Murasaki. Waka means young, and Murasaki is a plant, also known as Cromwell, that loans its name to the dye derived from its roots and the color that dye makes, purple or violet. I'll come back to that when we get to clothing. The plant, Murasaki, is mentioned in reference to the child in poetry and becomes her sobriquet for the rest of the tale. For more on that poem and the poetic associations of Murasaki, Watch the next Waka Wednesday. I've said before that it's the tiny differences we're after. In general, the translations are all saying the same thing in slightly different ways, so those tiny differences in word choice stand out. In this regard, there are two instances of differences in gender I'd like to explore. When Genji is peeping through the fence, Murasaki runs in red-faced and crying because Inuki has released her sparrow, or according to Seidenstecker, sparrows. Our older translators interpret Inu, or Inuki, as a little boy, while Seidenstecker onward refer to Inuki with feminine pronouns. Our second instance happens after the hailstorm. Genji has left Murasaki's home and attempts to find refuge with an occasional lover. He has a retainer sing out a poem twice, and the person who replies is female in Washburn, but Suematsu says this is a man who answers. Whaley describes the person as an impertinent coxcomb of a valet. Valets, or valets, are male servants in every context I've come across from the 1920s and 30s when this version was translated. Seidenstecker's translation provides an ordinary maid who seemed, however, to be a woman of some sensibility, 
and Tyler also uses the feminine with a nice looking servant woman. What a range. I'm not surprised to see a familiar grouping though. More often than not, when translation differences arise, our two older translators see things one way and the three more modern another. When seeking the more true translation between these two groups, I lean heavily towards the modern translations. There have been a number of times, especially in the differences in the way clothing is described, that I can actually tell what is a more true translation and what misses the mark. There's something about the differences in the story Yoshikio tells Genshi about the Akashi priest and his daughter that keep bubbling up for me. I realize part of this is the foreshadowing. Flip ahead and glance at the title of chapter 13. But back to our differences. Most of our translators say that the daughter has been told that she must throw herself in the sea if her father should die before arranging a suitable match for her. But Whaley's translation is very different. If she chooses against his will, and when he is gone, flouts his set purpose and injunction to satisfy some idle fancy of her own, his ghost will rise and call upon the sea to cover her. This interpretation really changes that story. Here the ocean will be caused to drown her if she chooses against her father's wishes. This feels like another instance of that subtle misogyny I pointed out in the first chapter in the descriptions of the painting of Yang Guifei. Some idle fancy of her own, indeed. With the other four translations all syncing up, I'm going to say Whaley was way off base with this one and seems to have inserted a bit of his own notions into the tale. Sometimes the differences between translations are not so small. I found another omission by Suematsu, a short scene. While on his way to a rendezvous, Genji happens by the house of the nun and stops to visit. He asks for Murasaki again and is told to wait until she is older again. Murasaki happens to innocently interrupt the interview, which Genji politely ignores. I wonder why Suematsu cut it, but then I wonder exactly that about all of his omissions. On to seasonal references. In this chapter, we move from the third month in spring through to the tenth month in winter. Most of our references to seasonality are flat statements such as in the seventh month and autumn arrives. But at the start of the chapter, we're told the season for blossoms, these being expressly cherry blossoms, has passed in the city, but the mountain cherries are still in bloom. This was in the third month, which corresponds to early April. Suematsu provides the last day of March. Later, autumn is described as the season when agreeable receptions were held by the emperor in court. Whaley mentions the festival of red leaves in the 10th month, which would line up with November. Modernly, there are plentiful autumn leaf festivals in November, but this particular one doesn't seem to have continued as it was into the present day. Gift giving makes another appearance. The old hermit and the bishop both offer Genji gifts. His returning entourage has brought with them gifts from the capital for the hermit and the priests and the monks at the temple, even down to the woodcutters. Here we see gifting culture for what it so often is, a repayment for services and a display of wealth or conspicuous consumption. Speaking of conspicuous consumption, let's discuss clothing. With chapter five, we have another instance of the majority of clothing references being small mentions without good descriptions of what the garments really are. Genji is in a disguise or common attire and is ashamed for the bishop, a man of rank, to see him dressed that way. Shonagun is sewing robes and at one point changes into more attractive robes. After his tryst with Fujitsubo, Omiobu gathers Genji's clothes and brings them to him. The only genuine description we get is of the outfit Murasaki is wearing the first time Genji sees her. Over a white gown, she's wearing a yamabuki or carrier rose layering. This is kuchiba, ochre or old leaf tan as the outer layer and ki, yellow as the lining. In Liza Dalby's kimono fashioning culture, she offers three different yamabuki layerings, all beautiful shades of yellows and golds and all appropriate from the new year through spring. This also makes the gown a seasonal reference and lets the reader know that Murasaki is being dressed by someone who knows the proper seasonality of the colors or kasane, color combinations. I promise to circle back to Murasaki. There's a little more that's fascinating about the purple derived from Cromwell. It's an incredibly ephemeral dye. I've read that it sun bleaches quickly. It's also a bit tricky to use as it requires a high alum mordant to fix the color. It's also labor-intensive to extract the dye from the roots of the plant. 
all of this bundles together, with other reasons I'm sure, to make it one of two forbidden colors. Murasaki was reserved for empresses. It was the color, so much so that the word for color, iro, was at one time associated with Murasaki as Murasaki iro and just iro. As we've seen in previous chapters, women of no very great rank did wear purple, just not this purple. What stood out for you in this chapter? Let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching. Join me next time for chapter six, Suetsu Muhana, Safflower. Subscribe if you'd like to explore the Heian period of Japan with me through the tale of Genji.